All right, we are going to call to order our July 31st we're going to call to order our July 31st, 2023 meeting, uh, public safety committee meeting. And uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, in our packet, we do have some written updates, photo red, police fire overtime, SPD canine deployment, sit lie, strategic initiatives. Uh, there's also an integrous architecture progress report. And so if there's anything relevant there, Chief, feel free to mention that, but you're first up on our list uh, for a fire update. Great, thank you. Well, good afternoon. This is just an update from an incident that occurred yesterday that just reinforces, reinforces a decision and a number of, um, number of triggers that uh, this body enacted to allow an outcome. And I know that's a little convoluted, but let me show you with some pictures here. So an incident happened yesterday uh, around 6.30 in the, in the evening or, or late afternoon, uh, right at Five Mile and Maple in a group of condos. You may uh, be familiar with them. There's two that sit right on the base of uh, Five, Mile, Five Mile Prairie, the hill that it's pretty significant southeast facing slope, very dry, heavy timber. It's known kind of uh, what we introduced the council to a couple of years ago called the Wildland Urban Interface Area. Uh, we had a number of callers that called 911 reporting initially a four by three fire in the brush next to the condos, one of the larger buildings. Later it turned into uh, another caller reporting 15 by 15 and then another caller reporting that the apartment was involved. Our first company on scene arrived within six minutes of dispatch. And if you can, I know for people that are on TV or maybe watching on the internet, this is the area which I'm speaking of. At the base of the hill, obviously the topography isn't reflected in the imagery, but large group of condos here where the purple uh, icon is and my cursor. And then there's a, this, this area above the purple this is all hev heavily uh, brush and timber and urban interface area. The interface, again, urban, wildland. Um, and then at the top of the hill, you see a, a number of homes uh, on Five Mile Prairie. So the fire itself started accidentally by a person in the condo that was cooking. Uh, one of our number one causes of fires in the home is cooking. Uh, grease fire, the gentleman I spoke with him last night, he uh, admitted to it right away as soon as the first companies were arriving, said that uh, the grease caught on fire and he knew not to put water on it, which is great from an education standpoint. He actually received burns on his hands and he threw it out his window, out of his back, mm -hmm. because he didn't want to keep it inside the house. It Probably a normal human reaction, especially when you're in pain, but unfortunately that burning material dropped below the apartment building and started a fire at the base. This is what we call the origin or uh, the yellow of the fire. And then our companies anchored using this road uh, surface and fought the fire up the flank on the left side and on the right side with the priority of saving these homes that were at the top of the uh, five mile prairie. You can see when we GPS it just a, probably an hour ago, how close the fire actually came to these homes. I'm not talking about just simply uh, six inch flame lengths. This is what we were faced with, well over 60 uh, feet of flames that were approaching those homes. This is a picture early in the fire just as uh, I was arriving. This is the first condo and another condo to the right of, uh, the, uh, of the photograph or the, the slide there. So what we talk a lot of times in, in this format about um, precautions that, that homeowners can take in terms of reducing the threat of wildland fire, especially in Spokane being the number, almost the number one challenge in the state for wildland urban interface fires, removing all the, the brush that accumulates over years, limbing up trees, spacing trees appropriately, and definitely using that, um, using that safety zone around a residence. This is kind of what I'm talking about. We, we've used this uh, in a lot of our talks out to the community with 
our fire protection engineers, fire marshals, the importance of that 30 foot and then eventually 100 foot for the, uh, the safety zones that you need to establish your property to protect it. This is an example of uh, property that was not protected, that was not uh, meeting the standard that we preach from the fire service in terms of the 30 feet. This is uh, Ponderosa right up next to the deck and probably just about anywhere else this, uh, this home would have been lost. If it wasn't for the fact that we deployed a commercial response and they all arrived as quick as they did, uh, we certainly could have lost a neighborhood yesterday. It was a red flag day. We had wind, we had low humidity around 13 to 15%. It was definitely a fire day, but they stopped it right when this tree torched. Burned right up next to uh, the uh, condo. You can see it, it did burn uh, portions of the structure, which was immediately stopped by Quint 13 when they first arrived. We protect people's lives first. Uh, we, had, we had folks that were evacuating people from those apartments, and then we protect property second. In this case, fortunately, and what we talk about with time, fortunately we had a full deployment, which we were able to deliver 27 firefighters in around 11 minutes. If it wasn't for that number of people at the top of five mile and then at the bottom of five mile working together to pinch that fire off at the top of the neighborhood, it could have had really disastrous complications and, and outcomes. Again, it did get hot enough to uh, break windows. One of our lieutenants that was working underneath the fire trying to protect that building had glass come down on him and cut him. Um, he was injured. He, uh, he continued the rest of his shift and worked through it. And he and his company were responsible for saving uh, that condo and then subsequently the house is up there. Just a reminder, if you look on the WUI map, the state, this is, this is Spokane. They don't even count the areas inside the city. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't get calculated in wildland and urban interface. So many of our parks aren't, aren't shown here. But look at what we're, look at what we face in terms of risk all around the outside of the city. Red, of course, is being the most significant in terms of risk to the public and to a promulgation carrying fire. One thing that I'm very proud of, um, you can see these areas on the north side, uh, Councilmember Stratton especially, these are areas where our, um, our fuels mitigation specialist has already um, has already applied fuel treatments, meaning we've had crews in to city property, removing those dead limbs, treeing up or limbing up uh, trees, removing all that, that dead um, brush and lower level brush to uh, make sure that city property is protected and that if it does enter into city property, which this fire certainly may have, this is our fire right here. And these are the properties the city owns, which we've done fuel treatments. We're well over about 120, 130 acres thus far at a cost uh, if, if we were to pay, uh, pay labor today on a private contract, it would probably cost us about $300,000 and it's cost us around $30,000. Thanks predominantly to grant funding and our partnership with DNR. So all of those fuel mitigation uh, projects are in place and finished up in those areas. And that's it. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you do have specific <laughs> questions. And I just think it was, uh, it was a good outcome and definitely would not have had the same outcome if it wasn't for staffing and the training dollars that you've allocated. And then, of course, our fuel mitigation treatments, which are probably all started on a deck on South Hill several years ago when you first got on console, if I remember right. Yes. Yeah. So that's great. So again, that just raises our concern about Eagle Ridge and 195 in access because they did have a fire not too long ago that came right up. Well, it did burn a home, but it didn't burn other homes because of the quick response. And you use the word fortunate. You use it not lucky, but just fortunate that we had the staffing to attend those fires. So that's a little disconcerting as we struggle with that location as well. I know Five Mile continues to be an issue. Could you speak to the other park lands? Because there is a lot of park land that's urban, rural, wildlife. Uh, my thinking is Underhill Park. There's a lot of dry brush at Underhill Park right below the bluff. 
So is there anything community members could do or any other partnership other than DNR? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we, do a, we do a triage, essentially. We look at all the priorities and we're tied in with parks and with our arborist at parks to prioritize those projects like the golf courses mm -hmm. where we've removed a large number of trees that were diseased and infested with beetle uh, to, to eliminate those and move them out because we know if we leave those in, they exacerbate. So we're constantly uh, moving the needle. I just showed you the, the state's map. That's certainly not our map. Mm -hmm. If it was our if it was our specific map, I could show you areas, especially around Underhill, uh, below Liberty Park, mm -hmm. number of other areas that are still our priorities. And it's just funding, and it's funding and it's time. Right now is not a good time to do fuel mitigation, but certainly in the off seasons, it it's a priority of the resources that we have. And just to follow up too, you're you're exactly correct with um, my words. Fortunate mm -hmm. is on a number of levels. We were fortunate that all of our companies were in service, that were first in, were in service in, in place and available to respond. They weren't tied up on uh, non-urgent emergency medical calls or they weren't tied up on simultaneous incidents. Everything worked the way that it was supposed to yesterday. Yes, we were very fortunate. 195, the challenge with 195 that we have specifically is it is on an island. Um, just this weekend, we moved a new fire truck there. It is a, it's an old fire truck. It's a 2001 fire truck, but it replaces a small attack unit. So now they have a type one engine. It's fenced in, it can't park in the garage because it's a residential garage. So we had to put a fence around it to protect it. And we're not gonna be able to keep it there during the winter. But right now when we need it, which was this morning at 0800, we had a, a car fire that started on 195 that quickly spread to the brush mm. and was threatening a number of homes as it as it went up that hillside. So um, we're very uh, we're very concerned about 195 and certainly concerned about uh, the company that we have out there is is staffed just like all the other fire stations in Spokane, but they are very far away from help. Station four, station 11, coming up from the hill are the two closest companies. And remember our effective response force, we have to deliver 17 firefighters within 11 minutes. We can't do that there, but we can do it in areas where we have a uh, greater concentration of resources. Thank you. Let's continue to talk about that for just a second because we hear from those folks about their fear of fire and how they would evacuate because there's so few roads going out that would actually get them someplace safe. and. If you had to move the truck during the winter, just because it's winter, it could be, it, it's going to be in a La Nina winter with low snowfall, probably not a lot of rain. We still could have a fire there and you wouldn't have that truck. So is it safe to say that we need to prioritize a fire station in the Eagle Ridge area so that we can help protect those people? Well, if, um, you may not remember, but We've had a fire station plan for Station 5 since the Werner administration. We purchased land right at Cheney, Spokane, yeah. across the street from the gas station. That, that has been our priority for years, and it has not been funded. It's a $7 million ask mm -hmm. to, to build a fire station there. The home that we were uh, occupying is temporary. Uh, it was great for its time, but it's not in the right place. We need better access because we're an all-risk agency. We, we do have fires, and we, we, we respond to those, but we also have emergency medical calls yeah. and hazardous materials calls and just about anything under the sun that can happen in that, in that canyon. So it's extremely important for us to have a fire station there. And, and I think you'll also remember Station 6 with, uh, with our leasing agreement is also a priority. Right. Both of those were built or both of those were occupied as temporary stations. They need permanent stations. So you're not on the capital it's, plan? It's been on the capital for years, but okay. it just hasn't been funded. Okay. So on, on that note, do you know where the study is, the fire study that's ongoing that's looking at the capital issues? I do, and, and they've been great to work with. The, the update is in your uh, packet under Integris. So uh, we've, we've, been, we've been meeting with them. We've got some good data. Dark Horse, a consultant that we've been working with on deployment has actually, the reason why I mentioned Station 5 and the move is that just reaffirmed our belief of that it, that is too far south, that it needs to be moved up a little bit more. We're close. The, the delivery date for them is September. 
Okay. So I think we'll have a good we'll have a good study that we'll be able to bring forward to you with a bunch of recommendations. So do we think September or October we'll be able to do a big presentation on what's in that? My hope would be the end of September. Okay. That way it'll give us if do we have four council member council meetings in September. So we should we okay. should be able to get on a study session for one of those. Okay. Very good. Anything yeah. else? Just quickly, how has the response been with the heat dome that's over the city? How has your calls increased just for medical assistance? It's been pretty well staying uh, as high as it has been in our recent history, barring any wind event. Uh, normally now we're about 150 calls a day, which are, you know, could be multiple responses. So you could double that with uh, multiple responses on those calls. But it's, this is our busy season. This is the busiest uh, yesterday and, and days prior that we've seen thus far this year. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. Uh, Chief Meidel. Good afternoon, Chair Council, Council Member Cathcart, Council yeah. President Kinnear, Council Members. So I was asked to speak to uh, or give an update on legislative changes from several years, years ago regarding minors and related to recent crime trends that we are seeing. Uh, real quickly, I'd just like to go over uh, for just a quick moment, RCW 1340, 470, I'm sorry, 1340, 740, which is juvenile access to an attorney. And it basically states law enforcement shall provide a juvenile with access to an attorney for consultation, which may be provided in person by telephone or by video conference before the juvenile waives any constitutional rights if a law enforcement officer questions a juvenile during a custodial interrogation or detains a juvenile based on probable cause of involvement in criminal activity. And there are some carve outs for this as well. Uh, and that is related to if the juvenile is a victim of human trafficking or if necessary to protect an individual's life from imminent harm. If a delay to allow legal consultation would impede the protection of an individual's life from imminent threat or questioning is limited to matters reasonably expected to obtain information necessary to protect an individual's life from an imminent threat, imminent being immediate. So basically what, what this means if law enforcement in the state of Washington believes that a juvenile or a minor has been involved in a crime, by law they are required to consult an attorney before they can interview that, that minor. And that's if it's two in the morning or two in the afternoon. Our experience here and across the state has been Obviously, the attorneys always say, no, do not speak to law enforcement. I mean, that has to do if you think the person is either directly involved or maybe was with the other minor while they were committing the crime, and it may be culpable at some level as well. And I just want to go over a couple real quick. I just did a cursory search um, for articles across the state um, that, that kind of help illustrate what other agencies are experiencing as well as Spokane. So from the Yakima Herald, this is a new Washington law requires kids to talk to attorneys before police can question them. Uh, Yakima County Sheriff Bob Udell said attorneys will most likely advise kids to not speak to police and that has been our experience which he said could prevent authorities from helping them get out of that lifestyle of crime that many of them um, have found themselves involved in as well. So law enforcement is meant to be deterrent and when that deterrent is, is uh, roadblocks are, are put in place then that deterrent is obviously diminished. Uh, the sheriff also said that getting a teen into the juvenile justice system, starting with interrogation, may get them off the path to prison. Again, it's that deterrence. Uh, sometimes law enforcement is the one conduit kids have out of the place they are in. If we cannot get statements from them, we can't help them. And then the prosecutor also said that juveniles are committing more violent crimes, and this law could inadvertently shield them from prosecution. That is what we are seeing as well in the city of Spokane. Another one from Cairo 7. Uh, this was published February of this year. Spike in juvenile crimes has Washington law lawmakers taking note. Spike in juvenile crimes is hitting Pierce County particularly hard. This is from a Sergeant Darren Moss. What I normally see in the recent year and a half is that our biggest crimes that we're having are being committed by younger and younger people. Violent crime has increased across the entire state, but specifically in our region. A lot of our shootings are victims who are 13 and 15 year old kids. Uh, multiple teens have been killed into coma over the past six months. A 16-year-old boy was shot and died in January. The same month, a 14-year-old boy was also killed in gun violence. And a 14-year-old girl was shot and killed in July of 2022. We are also seeing a significant amount of increase in, in uh, juvenile crime in the city of Spokane. And so what that means, I'll give you a, a real-world example from Spok the Spokane area. 
Uh, last year we had a rash of burglaries and these juveniles were taking stolen vehicles and crashing them into, they crashed them into a gun store. They were able to gain entry and store and steal armfuls of firearms. These were kids that were going to, most of them were going to public school. So we were able to identify who we believed were involved and unfortunately we were not able to interview them. Uh, they, we contacted the attorney, the attorney said no, don't, don't speak to them. Several days later our officers were able to get enough intelligence to go and execute some search warrants on these locations and uh, we were able to retrieve a couple guns but the majority of the guns had disappeared and we were told by uh, one of the juveniles that was involved that the night that we actually initiated the arrest, had we been, been able to talk to these juveniles, we probably could have retrieved all of those firearms. But several days later, <laughs> when we finally were able to sit down and talk with one of the juveniles, uh, we weren't able to retrieve the most of them. Right now we have a, a rash of vehicle thefts that are occurring as well. Juveniles are involved in those. Um, so we're, we're seeing a, a real issue with it. A lot of our issues down at Riverfront Park, not all of them, but a lot of them involve packs of juveniles as well. Uh, one example that occurred last year as well during one of our, our main community events, we have multiple juveniles downtown, which we love. Come, come down, it was a beautiful day, it was the summertime, but we started receiving complaints of some of these groups of juveniles assaulting some of the other families that were down there. And there were juveniles everywhere. And so we had a group we thought may have been involved, but because we thought they were involved, uh, but we didn't have probable cause to make an arrest, we can't even go up and interview them and ask them questions about, hey, we're getting complaints of assaults occurring. You guys somewhat match the description. Uh, one of the groups was allegedly involved in a robbery downtown as well, but we, until, unless we can go up and talk to them to find out are they involved or not, uh, it makes it challenging to hold the juveniles accountable. And in, in what we're seeing overwhelmingly is every time we call an attorney, they say don't speak to them. So that's, that's created challenges, and I know I've brought this up in some other meetings as well, that the juvenile cannot even willingly waive that right to talk to an attorney. The parents cannot waive that right for the juvenile as well. So we're, we're seeing struggles across the state with our, our juvenile crime increasing significantly. Go ahead. Um, so as you know, we've worked really hard on this park ordinance. And part of the reason is because of some of those gangs that are hanging out in parks. So how does that affect that um, ordinance that we're hoping to move forward tonight, we can still, as long as there's probable cause, then police can go in. If it's juveniles, they can still take action. That's correct, yes. And get them out of there, but then the complexity comes after with attorneys and all of that stuff? Uh, yeah, so if, if, they're, if they're in the park after hours, uh, their, their mere presence and the observation by a law enforcement officer okay. being in the park after hours, is that probable cause? The areas where we're struggling is when we have assaults or uh, we have shootings or we have um, things like this this gun store burglary that occurred okay. and we contact them after the fact, whether it's hours or days after the fact, uh, being able to continue that investigation and talk to them. We're invariably being told, no, we're not gonna speak to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So Chief, well, oh, no, you go ahead. So, sounds a little devious, but I go there every once in a while. Is it possible for a uh, police officer to get one of the juveniles to talk if they get some immunity or make a deal with them and their attorney, rather than getting them all to talk, all you have to do is get one of them to talk. Uh, and that, that does happen on occasion. Unfortunately, by the time the attorney's usually available, and again, a lot of these are occurring in the middle of the night, it's usually several days, if not more, after the incident uh, before they're they're willing to sit down and have what we would call a free talk, uh, so that can that can take days. Sometimes it can take a week or, or longer. And while that's better than what we currently have, it still doesn't help in those scenarios where we may have a violent assault that occurred or a shooting. Uh, and now we're we're three or four days behind the ball of trying to either get evidence or stolen firearms or get this very dangerous person in custody. So it can occur, uh, but it's something that that doesn't help in that immediate moment when we have these, especially the violent offenders. Those are the ones that clearly cause the most concern for us. Those are the ones that we want to try to get off the streets as quickly as possible. And, and sitting down three or four days later is helpful, but not nearly as effective as being able to interview them at the time we contact them. Do the parents have immunity? Or in other words, can the parents uh, talk with police about their child and where their child was or was not? Um, the parents can, yes. So they could 
ostensibly testify against their child. They could tell the police, yeah, Junior was here when he should have been at home. Um, they could. Um, a lot of times what we're seeing with a lot of the juveniles that are committing the crimes that create the most concerns is their parents just don't know where they're at. They well, think they're hanging out over at Billy's house. That's and, to my point. They yeah. don't know where they are. So the parent could say, yeah, I don't know where this kid was. It's likely he was here. So not that the parent's going to flip and turn the kid in, but it, it, it's a possibility. It is, absolutely, yeah. So, Chief, I, I, I can assume what the motivation was, you know, behind this change in state law and, you know, dealing with young people and wanting to protect them, and I'm sure the intentions were very good, but do you see a path to a fix or some, some sort of a, a tweak that would still, uh, that, that, that you think would be palatable to the legislature that could, that we should consider or think about or talk to our legislators about with regards to this that might help improve our situation? Yeah, I, I think that, that, you know, without rolling it back to how it was, and, and I should add that uh, several years ago, we completely, completely revamped our juvenile CRs, our, our constitutional rights that we give to minors, and we actually, we actually borrowed it from, I believe, King County, does that sound right? Yeah. And it's very plain language. It's explaining you have the right to consult an attorney. And it explains in language uh, that someone 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17 year old would understand. It says anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. It explains here's what that means, and it, and it lays that out. So we, we, several years ago, modified ours to be very, very understandable, even for these 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Um, so one of the things I think may, is there a happy medium where the legislators would consider allowing a 16-year-old and above, given the appropriate, age-appropriate Miranda warnings, would they be willing to allow the, the minor to waive those rights? And I say 16, we trust 16-year-olds to drive 5,000-pound vehicles on the road without an adult. Uh, you know, 17-year-olds can join the military. I went to boot camp when I was 17. We have some of these some of these states where you could be 14 years old and drive 10 ton concubines on the street. We trust them with that. Um, and as you all know, this has been a hot topic lately as well. We, we allow juveniles to make decisions about their gender that will have lifelong implications under the age of 18. So we're allowing all these other things. So it makes sense as 16, maybe that happy medium where you're 16 and above, age appropriate Miranda rights, we can still interview you without that mandatory consultation to the attorney. And, and do you think just based on the data in Spokane and issues we've had that that's about the age where it would, that would actually be very helpful for? It, it, will be, it will be very helpful. It's not going to solve all of our issues. Um, you know, we had a shooting uh, recently where there's a 15-year-old that was the suspect as well. Um, and, and thankfully, because of other evidence, we were able to determine who that was. It would be extremely helpful, um, and it would be a step in the right direction. Okay. Any other thing else for the chief on this? Uh, and then, Chief, uh, I've got you here for the gang activity update. Councilwoman Wilkerson well, had approval. Well, and that might lead into the gang activity oh. update. And just some of the conversations we were having about age appropriateness, a lot of those are life-changing decisions, but none of those decisions that they're making could lead to them incarceration. So when they lose their liberty, that's a whole other level of whether join the military or life-affirming changes, those things. When you get your liberty taken away, that's challenging. I guess I'm frustrated with also my drum is about education and how do we get that information out there uh, to parents and to young people because they say no because they don't understand the law because it is complex. And so i rather, which I've told my kid the same thing, don't say anything until you get an attorney or one is present for you. So there is some real reasons why the law was changed to accommodate that. And let's not lose sight of that. Uh, I'm open to other ideas, but we really have to realize uh, the state that we're in before we start just assuming 16-year-olds can make those kind of decisions. Also, um, back to Councilmember Stratton, how these gang act, not gangs, groups of young people will impact the park ordinance tonight. As we said, or I said, these are groups of people we never really identified the age when we put this ordinance together. Um, so 16 and under, 16 and older. So you can come and you can ask some questions, but then it's just shut down. So it doesn't matter 24, 7, day or night. It'll be interesting to hear what kind of feedback you give if this is really getting the outcome that we were trying to achieve. Yeah, and uh, Captain Hindren is here to speak yeah. on that uh, when that pops up on the All right, schedule thanks. as well.
And so I have Lieutenant Booth here to speak to the, uh, the, the request about uh, update <coughs> on our gang activity as well. Okay. Thank you. And then, I don't know who's going to Well, hello. Uh, for an update on Spokane Criminal Street Gangs, this was actually put together by Adam Valdez, who's our gang information officer with the uh, Safe Streets Regional Task Force. First, we wanted to find what the gang is, and by the uh, revised Code of Washington, a criminal street gang is uh, means any ongoing organization, association, or group of three or more persons, whether formal or informal, having a common name or common identity, sign or symbol, having one of its primary activities as a commission of criminal acts, and whose members or associates uh, individually or collectively engage or have engaged in a pattern of criminal street gang activity. So when we start talking about things like gangs and people want to know uh, why is this person in a gang, or we want to make sure our words are important. And so we, we want to stay with what the uh, state law says and how we codify what a uh, street gang is. Uh, gang violence here. Uh, we have small uh, issues that lead up to larger issues, the murders, the shootings, and the assaults. Uh, we're seeing an extreme level of violence of the shooting and stabbings. Uh, and they're rarely not premeditated. There's some type of triggering event. But as opposed to a large triggering event, we're seeing that uh, social media is playing such a significant role that somebody will say something on one of the social media forums and that will start a chain reaction that ends up in some uh, high level of violence. A uh, little history on the gangs in Spokane. In the 1970s, we just had local gangs or clubs or affiliates. Um, in the 1980s in Southern California, that's when we first had our influx of the criminal street gangs. Uh, the crack epidemic that was uh, in LA brought the gangs up from California. They made more money up here. There was tended to be uh, a, a wider market. Uh, and so uh, as that expanded, they started coming up here. Uh, there's also some of the leniences in the, in the law in that uh, we had a lot of people that would come up from California, they'd get arrested for delivery or possession of crack cocaine back in the day. And then because of how the system worked, they'd be charged. Uh, we had to wait till the lab results, so there wouldn't be the full charge until, so they'd beat the 72 hour window, they'd fly back to California. We'd issue a warrant, but it was non-extraditable. So they would just do their 72 hours and then go home, which was actually mentioned in a uh, Snoop Dogg song of, of do your 72 in Spokane and then come home. Um, in the uh, 1990s, the uh, Spokane uh, gangs began to form in Spokane neighborhoods, East Central, West Central, Hilliard, and Brown's addition. So that early influx that came in, they'd started to uh, create a root and a base, and now they're creating their own little cultures uh, that were based on the structure and the composure of our Southern California uh, Bay Street gangs. In the early 2000s, we uh, began to see that the, not only the southern but the northern street gangs are coming up from California as well, and the gangs began to expand beyond the city borders and into the county as well. In the 2010, with the rise of the squads, and I know the next question is, what's a squad? And I appreciate when you ask the questions, it feed right into my uh, narrative, so that works out well for all of us. A uh, squad is essentially a clique or a small group of people that are hanging together that may or may not have a street gang name or affiliate, but now there is just that group that's starting to form. Uh, we have uh, the gang investigators at that time. We see a group in uh, youth gangs, some as young as 10. And a lot of that is because culturally, there's, we, have, uh, we started in the 1980s, and now you have generational gangs beginning we, uh, where the, the parents were involved, and now their children are involved. And it just keeps going on and on. One of our recent uh, shootings, the, both the father and his son were uh, suspects and are now uh, in, have been formally charged with uh, homicide. We have uh, more violent gang members are identified by uh, school leaders who are concerned with the violence. The gang investigators at that time stopped uh, to prevent gang membership. In the 2020s now, we have uh, turf gangs or smaller, like we're seeing in the park, where they're just taking over uh, specific geographic areas. Uh, rivalries are turning uh, violent. We have our murders, drive-by shootings, uh, normal gang encounters. Uh, most violent encounters are between youth gang members and... Uh, so this was a recent surveillance video of, you have the two people up in the top. Uh, this is, a, he's joining the gang, so part of the initiation culture is there gonna be a beat in. What? Where is that? 
Is this a local video? Yes. Okay. Where is that? Uh, this is in downtown Spokane in a parking garage. Oh, gracious. How did they get into a parking garage without somebody not seeing them? Oh, people see things all the time. It's are they paying attention? But, okay. Um, recruitment, so we were seeing it in middle schools, parties, high school, local hangouts. Uh, they're drawn to this. There's uh, the online presence is substantial. You're seeing, you know, culturally, what you know, as a collapse of family structure and everything, there's a need for protection, for for association, for you know, a feeling. And a lot of times, the gang uh, members are fulfilling the need where traditional family roles would have fulfilled that. Current trends, uh, again, we're seeing a significant amount of juveniles. Uh, social media is a, a, a large triggering event. It's also an open market uh, as far as, you know, narcotics trafficking and, and, and getting those con uh, connections. There's no, fo no formal structure or organization, unlike in the 1980s and 90s when they're uh, mirroring the California street gangs. There's a clear structure and behavior and rituals and norms uh, within that, and there's, there's not. There, it's, there's, sir, please. So does that mean there's no like hierarchy? Uh, yeah, uh, there, there is a hierarchy, whereas before this person would be in charge and there would be people underneath that now it, it's, it's in flux and it's not respected. And there's an actual, between the older generation of gang members and the newer ones, there's a lot of inner conflict because there was structure and, and, and norms and values within that. And now there's not. It's just uh, you're seeing they don't operate like traditional gangs. There's, there'll be enemies one week and the next week they're friends. And so a more, lot of it... More volatile? Oh, incredibly volatile. There's, there's not that hesitation. There's not... It's so immediate, much like our phones and all the electric media that we see, uh, there's instant gratification on being able to, you know, pop onto Amazon and order that thing that you needed that very second. And now we're seeing that same level of gratification or immediacy is being triggered with violence to where they'll see something uh, or somebody will post something on social media just as an act to start to incite something and it happens uh, because there's not that time. There's, there's no time for people to go, well, is that really? They're just not. And especially in our juveniles, they haven't developed that ability to, you know, self-reflect. You know, we, uh, they, they haven't been taught or been given the opportunity to develop those social skills and parameters about uh, all of that. It's just, it's a triggering event. And, of course, drug use and sales is, uh, is, is what fuels 98% of this. That we're, the the amount of narcotics flowing in and out of here is is, is uh, unprecedented. Yes, ma'am. So you use the word substantial increase. You just can't say that. That give me is that a ten percent increase? Is that five percent, fifteen? Because really, if the gangs are growing, how are you capturing that information to be able to share it with us to get the resources you need to do your job? So, where is the growth? Um, what do the numbers look like or how are you capturing data uh, to support your task force going forward? The data is substantiated by seizures, arrests, contacts, uh, and I can provide absolutely all okay. that with you. And I don't want to shoot from the hip. Oh, uh, but we, that, all that information is captured and quantified to be able to show w where we're at and, we're, or, and have a reasonable prediction of what's to come. Okay. And, to see and I had asked for demographics of gangs in Spokane. Oh, a while oh, back, and, and, but I was unable to receive that information, so I, if you do have that available, I, will, I, will I certainly will like it. Thank you. 100%. But we are seeing gangs, go, it's not limited to one ethnicity. It's, it's across the full spectrum. And so it's not that traditional, uh, what you would believe, it's just, it's everywhere. And so, and that leads it right into the lack of the cooperation from victims and witnesses during these investigations. They're incredibly uh, complex just because uh, not only the unwillingness to, to talk and that we're not getting that. They, the investigators rely substantially on uh, outside, you know, being able to get into the social media. Uh, you know, yes. Sorry, didn't no, mean to please. interrupt. Is there a way to hold the parents accountable? Oh, yeah, yeah, as far as criminally, there are, there are certain sanctions within certain laws that will mm -hmm. uh, hold parents accountable, but for the most part, uh, the, the grander question is no. 
the, the, the these children are released out into the, uh, not released, the, you know, there, there's so many, this is such a deep issue. It's, it's bone and marrow. And we can't separate it into, you know, one specific box. It, it's much like saying, well, we just want to deal with the drug problem. Well, that actually crosses into property crimes. That yeah. crosses into violent crimes. And yeah, one is feeding the other. Well, I'm just thinking if, you know, you're responsible for your kid. So if your kid commits a crime, by association, you're, you're, it's your responsibility, and you yeah. can be held accountable. Yeah, uh, I w in, a, in, a, in a perfect world, I'm sure we, we could get things like that, but as it exists right now, uh, the no okay. would be the short answer. Yeah. Okay, we can pass a law. So, oh, we we're, could, but the, you know, the Constitution, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, ma'am. You know, we, we talk a lot about, and we hear a lot about upstream and how we prevent, right? And so is there, the, does, do you have or does SPD have any thoughts on how we can better prevent kids from falling into these situations? Uh, uh, you know, yes, in fact, uh, there's a specific program. Uh, uh, again, Adam Bell does, does a fantastic job on this to where they, they and I'll, I'll get to the name of it here in a minute because it's eluding me this exact second, but to where they go and interview the younger uh, gang members. They do it with some of the older ones. They do interventions. They go to the schools, uh, and they, that's part of the identifying, you know, knowing who these people are. And then you, you, you meet with them, and, and the whole thing is to try and say, hey, they're, they're, without some type of intervention, they'll continue in this behavior. And so they try to get some of the uh, older generation, and they meet up with them, and it's an – and so – we, we have a saying in uh, TAC Ops is relationships equal mission success. And that applies equally to what the Safe Streets program is doing to where they know the families, they know the people, and you can get in and you can just sit down and have a coffee with them, and then you can talk about these problems. And it's not us and them. It's, we're, it's e pluribus unium. You know, out of many, there is one. I know you want to ask about the D.A.R.E. program. Well, always. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we talked about some of the trouble uh, with the investigations and, and uh, some of the outside sources. This is from uh, Fifth and Fisk, and some of the uh, we were able to, uh, in order to aid in the investigation, this is a video taken from our, our STA buses. Whoa. It's actually going to capture one of the drive-by shootings. And so we're relying on all this type of technology just because the ability to get a witness sometimes or a cooperating individual is, is incredibly tough. And then, like as the chief was alluding, the vast majority of these are juveniles, and they, they have the cultural norms that are going to inhibit them wanting to talk to us, and now we have the legal uh, precedent behind it to where we, we can. Now we have these juvenile and juvenile on crimes, and the officers are showing up, and literally, you... you, you uh, if it wasn't for some of these outside intelligence sources, it'd be incredibly hard. To, it makes a hard job harder. And so to, to your question, sir, some of the prevention strategies, it's almost like we had this slide ready for you. So what we do here at the Spokane Police Department, uh, we're working closely with our major crimes, the county and the uh, prosecutor's office. They work with the juvenile detention center, provide mentors for the youth gang members while they're in custody. Uh, education employment mentors in the uh, Safe Communities Partnership. There's a name that eluded me. Uh, they're contacting family members and others who can have a positive influence on the gang members. Uh, but we talked about the recent legislation and youth gang members caught uh, with guns. Uh, we had one that was, uh, when they were in custody, it only took 30 days of max detention time before they're released again. So we're working with all the... Uh, uh, you, uh, available entities that we can, and like I said, they're, they're, they're exceptional about the prevention of getting out there and contacting these kids. So if we were, so, so we've been talking a lot for a long time about mostly drug prevention specifically, yes. and, and I, I love D.A.R.E., I think it's a great program, but some version of that. And I just wonder, could, could we, you know, if we're going to fund a program like that, could that be expanded in some way to include gang prevention, essentially, and, and make it a, a bigger, uh, better program that would affect, address kind of some of those different um, issues that, that our kids are dealing with. Well, that's a great thing about Spokane is, uh, and you know, we have organizations that exist within uh, that where all these people can get together and we as a community can do amazing things. And I, I really don't think there's, within our geographic boundaries, that's what makes Spokane so wonderful is that things like that can happen. And, and because people do care. And we're, it's not, you know, unfortunately you see some of the 
ones that we're probably not going to get those results in those communities here in Spokane. That that still exists. So yes, yeah, I, I, any uh, we have the data, we have the ability, and it, uh, that can be done. I was just going to say on the nexus of drugs, um, we have our cannabis fund that we're voting on tonight. We have our opioid fund. So there are monies that's not taken away from anybody else right. that will be allocated and dedicated for education prevent, prevention. So there's opportunity there. We just need to collaborate more. Excellent. Let's do it. Anything else? Yep. And we just got a, a couple more minutes and we're running out of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Next up, SPD hiring plan update. Good morning, council members. Um, I'll try to make this fairly quick because I know we're running short on time. So we had, well, first of all, there's two parts to hiring, right? We have the commission and we have the non-commission and they're both equally as important. I know the focus is often on the commission piece. So that's mostly what I will be speaking to. The first part of that test, aside from us or bringing somebody on, aside from us going out and recruiting is for individuals that are interested to take the public safety test. Following up from the public safety test, they have to actually submit an application to civil service. So our numbers have actually increased about 50% from 2019 to 2020 in terms of the number of people putting in for and taking the public safety test. The number of applications to civil service have not been as great as the number taking the public safety test. But they went up also from 2019 to 2022. So in 2019, we had 225 individuals submit applications to civil service. In 2022, we had 425. Now year to date through June, those numbers are down a little bit to civil service. So I also want to say that we have had a great relationship with civil service. Civil service has worked with us tremendously to improve our processes. We really try to have more of a human type process where it's not just, we don't want you, here's a letter. We try to communicate, we try to make it um, a friendly process and they have worked with us. They have systems that they have in place for a reason, but they have also been very good about working with us to try to help us make these processes easier mm -hmm. and for us to reach out to the applicants maybe sooner than we would have otherwise because I think that also makes a difference. It's that personal touch. We had a grant for about a year and a half that concluded in the end of June through CJTC. Through that grant, we were able to do a lot of work in terms of recruiting both in-state and out-of-state, and it really gave us the opportunity to see, um, what we, to see what we felt worked in terms of the recruitment. And what we came away learning from that was our primary recruitment places to go are the public safety tests themselves and also military events. So we don't have that grant anymore, so we're not gonna be able to go to as many events as we were with that grant, but we do plan on continuing to attend some public safety tests and some military events, yes sir. How much was that grant? The first year, uh, don't quote me, I think the first, it was actually six months. I believe we had like right around $40,000. And then the second was actually for a full year and it was right around $54,000. And would it be possible to quantify how, how many folks we were able to recruit as a result of that grant? It's, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how many put in because of that grant, but our numbers went up. And one, one thing that also went up, I think because we were able to expand our recruitment to both in-state and out-of-state. So if you look at um, January to March of 2021 compared to January of March to 2023, we increased the number of underrepresented, underrepresented community members that took the PST. We increased that number by 30%. So those are the kind of things that um, I can put out mm. there in terms of how many took it, specifically because we had the grant and can go to these different areas, I don't know. But we also had a, a big increase in the number of out-of-state applicants that took it, which I think is very much related to the grant because we were do, able to do a lot of out-of-state trips that we were not able to do otherwise. Well, and I guess I, I asked the question because for basically the cost of what half an FTE, if that is, you know, helping us to recruit, it, it should be something that we're at least continuing to discuss because obviously the more officers we can get on board, the better that's going to help our budget. And so I would hate to see us, you know, lose momentum in, in our recruiting efforts. Yeah, and I don't think we'll lose momentum. We definitely won't have the freedom because we don't, 
you know, that was a pretty good budget to be able to work from to pay for these, these trips. Um, we don't have that amount of money per se. I don't know that we'll lose momentum because we're going to focus on the, on the events that we felt we got the biggest bang for our buck um, in okay. terms of the applicants, which are the public safety tests, mostly in state, and then those military events. The military events have been pretty fruitful for us as well. Um, I do want to say it could be completely by coincidence, but I normally get the numbers of people on our list, like at the beginning of every week. So you have an entry level list, which are your people that take the public safety test and then send their scores to civil service. And then you have mm -hmm. the lateral list and that's just an application to civil service. So for the most part, for the lateral list, it's been like two, three. And like I said, it could be a coincidence, I don't know, but after the, um, the new contract passed, I think it was last week when I got my update, it was eight on the lateral list, which is a lot for like, I, that, that's a significant increase. That, that was, wow, that stood out. This week it's two, but that all, or six people, but that might be six laterals, but that might also be because I think we may have hired two. So right now, if things work out, because some of these are still in background process, we hope to hire an additional five laterals in September, but mind you, some of those are still in the background process. Um, and we hope to have, again, hope to have nine in the August Academy. So mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm, our recruitment efforts aren't perfect by any means. We can always look at them and try to continue to improve, do local events. I also personally, and, and, and the chief agrees with this, like we consider part of our recruitment efforts, even though we won't see the benefit till way down the road, mm -hmm. the community events that we go to, building those relationships with our communities in Spokane. And so we really try to go out to a lot of our community events and build those relationships because that can also lead, like I said, we may not see the benefit of that for five, 10 years, but we hope that that will get a whole group of individuals that may not have otherwise been interested in law enforcement, interested in law enforcement. That's good. Go ahead, Karen. Couple. Go ahead. Just a quick question. Um, are you also recruiting out to colleges and universities? Yes, we do reach out to colleges and universities. And actually with our colleges and universities, we try to use a Spokane Police Department member who has graduated from that particular college or university. And then we do a lot of outreach, so not just to the criminal justice program, right? But we try to reach other majors as well as the athletic teams. And the athletic oh. teams are usually very diverse. So we really try to, when it, we're doing those outreaches, try to meet specifically with different athletic teams. Interesting. Yes. Thanks. So I was just going to ask you, since you had gotten additional grants, which I thought the council had approved additional money for recruitment way back in the day. So has the budget for recruitment stayed the same and it was only because you got the additional monies that you felt your outreach was expanded? So your original recruiting budget, then extra monies, and the extra money made the difference. So going forward, since we're in budget season, is that being looked at? not knowing if you're going to get grant dollars or not to do additional recruiting? So I believe efforts? we did actually ask for some additional money for the rest of this year, and I, I don't remember exactly what that amount is because we knew this grant was coming to an end, right? So I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure for the remainder of the year, we did ask for some money for recruitment as well as in 2024. I don't know what that am exact amount is. And in terms of going back, I, I don't recall that we were approved like money for hiring, but I could also be wrong. So. I, I could be wrong. Maybe we just approved the grant that came through, and that's where my mind's stuck at. So, okay, well, we haven't seen anything come through for additional, but we'll keep our eyes open for it. Yes, Mr. Adler. Do you have a question? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. And well, last thing I'm going to add, so I know um, we had talked about doing a recruitment video, and you all said, hey, you know, this community or that person is interested in being in a video. We're working on a video. We did put together a great video. Um, and we're gonna we're trying to do something with that. So I just want to say thank you for the interest in that video. One more thing, Councilmember Kinnear and I are going to be done soon with our council roles. So if you want to, you know, send somebody to recruit us, <laughs> no. then maybe we can come work for the police department. Oh, there a, you go. First step a is a really, public safety test. Really bad idea. That's a really bad idea. <laughs> Public safety test. Uh, quick quick okay. question. The incentive dollars, I know we had about 50000 I think, that had lasted into 23. Is that expended now, or is there still a few? Little bit um, left? There's, well, we think we'll probably exceed. So it was enough for eight in 2023 is what it was for. 
we will most likely exceed that eight. Okay. Um, and then there was some money that's set aside for 2024 as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, next is the park ordinance. This will be short because we've only had this up for one day, <laughs> so. So yeah, uh, I, I, thanks council for having me up here. So I'll be very, very brief. Uh, last night was the first night that we had the ordinance to actually go out. Um, staffing is still a challenge for us. Um, so uh, our amount of enforcement and any special we have not done yet. Some of the plans though, the direction I put out at least for the Northwest sector is we've given them a strategy for education as far as contacting folks to let them know of the ordinance. If people are cooperative and compliant, we're trying to give at least a warning before we do any enforcement action, document that, but once people have been warned, we are looking to take enforcement action. Um, some of our big uh, issues also are with a lot of our homeless uh, individuals that have now moved into the parks. We've really seen an influx over the last month or two. Um, and with that, I have directed all my staff, please try to connect these people with services when we make contact with them. Again, we can't force them into services, but we'll at least make the offer and have that documented. So right now, I'm not aware of any enforcement that's actually occurred. Uh, we're kind of in that early stage, like I told the council before, our intent was to try to do education. We've done some media releases. I know Parks has also done some media releases as well, but a lot of that education also is those face-to-face -face conversations. Additionally, there's a lot of park property that people don't know is park property, and I actually had to ask the parks or acting parks director on that. And so with some of that, we're working on improving the signage. And in the meantime, we're actually using not only face-to-face -face contacts, but we're actually putting out flyers. For example, our campers along the river that are actually camped on city park property. Uh, so we can try to, because uh, I know the fire chief was talking earlier about uh, dangers. I will tell you that is a big concern for me down there on that riverbank, because uh, we do see campfires and, and the such from some of these folks. One, yes, sir. One thought I've had, what, what about private parks? I mean, could they, could, could there be an arrangement so that if, if it's after a certain hour, it's considered trespassing and if you guys see activity, you're able to enforce? If it's a private, if it's private property, we have no, it's up to the property <coughs> owner. We have no authority. So the, the only property owner would have to call each and every time. They can't just sit. Well, they could put stipulate. up no trespassing or they could put up no loitering, no, uh, no mm -hmm. trespassing during these hours. So they can do that. And we do that often with the, uh, Get a lot of complaints about this too, the activity on North Division with some of the car clubs and the racers and this, that, and the other. With some of those properties up there with cooperative property owners, we've done that. We'll put up clear signage. We get authority from the property owner. And so if we see people in violation of it, we can go actually make, a, uh, make an arrest if need be. So I, I think about Ripon Field and mm -hmm. if um, SYSA wanted to, to have an MOU with, with the police force, would that be something that could conceivably happen? Absolutely. And we okay. may already have something on file with them. I would have to look into it. But uh, uh, Ripon Field is actually outside of my sector. Mm -hmm. So I, it's been a while since I've looked at But I wouldn't be surprised. I think we have something on file with, okay. with uh, SYSA on that as well. So, any other questions? Yeah. Council President. Um, thanks for that. I, you seem to have a plan. And I would ask that, because this is for the north part of town, I would ask that, um, Chief, that you make sure that the rest of the um, precincts, so everybody's doing the same thing. We're all working, you know, we're all in the same way. Because I know we have issues um, in the south, too. Thanks. Other questions, any thoughts? Hearing none. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. All right. Let's go to Colin Quinhurst, uh, sidewalk safety. Oh, goody. This will not be pretty. And Inga, we're going to go to you next, just an FYI. Good afternoon, council members. Here to talk about um, shared mobility and sidewalk safety and just sidewalk safety in general downtown. I have a few slides um, as we go over this. Um, so just, I'll just cover real quick what we're doing now and, and what we can do better as far as, as the options we have to improve sidewalk safety downtown. Um, right now we have um, some stencils out on sidewalk corners, some signage, educational signage, and some rules to roll that are on our website and are on temporary signs on the streets downtown. But these are all areas where we can increase the amount of signage, refresh the stencils, uh, increase the number of flyers. And we've also put the rules to roll in the past in advertisements and media, like in the Inlander, 
Um, so we did that in 2019, but it's been a while since we've done that. So that's something we could bring back. Um, so as far as signage and stencils, yeah. Could, so I, I think it's great, but could it be bigger? Because I don't think that these really stand out as something that people really you know, see. And then my other question is, how long will it take to print new signage? Because I just heard the other day that we're backed up significantly in other signage that needs to be printed. And so I'm just kind of curious if you have a, a thought on that. Uh, yeah, we have some options. Um, <laughs> Standard Printworks downtown has been a good partner when we need something really fast. Um, so that's an option um, that we can use. So I, th I think we can find a way to, to produce e these quickly. Expedite it, okay. Yeah. Um, for the stencils, um, I personally painted these the first round and I think this time we're gonna hire someone to do it. Um, <laughs> it was a long, hot job and I'm not a professional at that. So um, I think we would put a contract out, but we have an existing contract with the company that does our bike corrals. Mm -hmm. They already have all the stencils they need, so we would look at increasing that contract for them. Okay. Um, and so as far as getting this information out, like the rules to roll, uh, flyers or even business cards, um, we do have a lot of partners that have been a great support in communicating information about the program. Uh, the Downtown Spokane Partnership in particular um, they ran a kindness crew during COVID that was out around downtown on scooters, encouraging people to do the right thing as far as following the rules of the road. So um, we could check back in with our partners, park rangers in Riverfront Park, and the police department have all been great partners in, in getting this messaging out. So that's something we'd look to, to strengthen again. Um, we do have a mandatory parking zone downtown. So when you're riding a scooter downtown, you have to park at one of those blue P symbols that are scattered around downtown in, in appropriate places to park, like wide corners or wide stretches of sidewalk. Um, so that is, is an option is to expand that zone, you know, further west towards Brown's Addition or um, further east around the university district. So, so that's another option where we can look at doubling down. Colin, could we also, if we're gonna look at that fix, I, I think it needs to be fixed, uh, the no parking allowed around the pavilion? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can revisit all I, those locations. Like I feel like we could just set up a little parking zone at the pavilion okay. and that would be very, very helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. We did have issues with people joyriding in the pavilion, so oh, that, gotcha. that became okay. one solution is to make that a no-ride zone. But we could fine-tune that. Um, and so these are the low-speed and no-ride zones. Um, as you get in the app, you see all these red zones pop up. So another option is, is fine-tuning these, expanding them, adjusting them to have broader low-speed zones or bigger no-ride zones. Um, and so that's an option we can look at together is is where those zones boundaries should be. Um, we also do those for specific events, like for Hoop Fest, we do all of downtown. Um, and so there is kind of a time frame, timing option too, as far as having certain zones up for a certain amount of time. Um, and this fall, uh, the current contract with Lime will expire and we'll be releasing a new request for proposals where any company can apply. Um, other cities recently, Chicago and San Francisco, have required that operators um, have sidewalk detection technology as part of their fleet. And so it's either a camera or some other system where the scooters can detect sidewalks. Um, it is new technology and it's very expensive to have them installed on scooters. So what these other cities have done is had a phase-in approach where the companies are required to have a plan for gradually implementing this technology and where they demonstrate progress at specific times. And, and so that's an option is that we include that in the next request. Well, so, so are you saying that that would fall on us to pay for that technology? Yeah. Uh, no, it would fall on the company, okay. but we okay. just need to work with them to come up with a schedule where, it's, where they can do it. Gotcha. And, and then the cost for rides for the cut will consumer go up, go up right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And then just in terms of enforcement though, I mean, could we include in that RFP, you know, some ability for them, like if a bike is left where it's not supposed to be, right. we could find Lime for that and then they could go after the user if, if, if they so choose. Um, but I think we should have a way to recoup because, you know, there's gonna be additional expense and, and headache as we try to keep these clear off the sidewalks and 
make a more concerted effort, so. Yeah, and uh, to your point, um, we included some language like that in the last contract extension. Um, so there's, there's precedent for us to be able to do that. Uh, the next step is figuring out the actual mechanism for you know which staff is going to go out and document that regularly. Right now, it's kind of as we go. So we do get some occasional photos from code enforcement as they're out and about of, of like egregious violations where there's like ten scooters blocking a sidewalk. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really in those like really bad situations that that we get those photos now. So code enforcement send you photos, but if it's in front of my house with five lime scooters, who would I call? Uh, you, you call 311, oh, 311. And they, they usually send them to me, send them to and you. so Ryan Shea or I sometimes go out when we hear of a really bad situation, and we'll document it, and we'll move the scooters, um, but it's, it's um, we need to come up with a better system, yeah. Because yeah. that's the frustration for neighborhoods, they're just laying everywhere, and especially for our handicapped folks, yeah. or mobility impaired, it's just a challenge that shouldn't be a challenge. Yeah, um, agreed. Mm -hmm. So one other thought uh, that I've had, and it, it, maybe this wouldn't be a deterrent uh, or enough of a deterrent, but could we, uh, at least until we have some sort of advanced sidewalk technology, just paint kind of the, the curb, like just the edge of the curb, you know, kind of like the caution colors and then just stencil on there, you know, no scooters allowed. And, and do that in some of the higher areas where we see a lot more folks riding on the sidewalks, just as an extra, make it very blatantly clear, like you are not allowed here. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a cool idea. I haven't seen that done before, but we can look into it. Yeah, yeah, like, like red, would, would yeah, red, like, or, for orange, you? yellow. You know, kind of the cautiony kind of colors. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's great. So, um, part of the problem I think is scooter riders don't feel safe in the street yeah. because our bike infrastructure downtown is woefully lacking. I think that has to happen in tandem with enforcement of this. So. Yeah. Until you get, until we get our bike infrastructure downtown up to, to a standard, people are going to continue to, to ride on the sidewalks. Right. They don't feel safe. Yeah. And I just have to comment on Councilmember Kinnear because really, it's really young kids that are riding on the sidewalk. So you see families with children that are under the age that should be riding those Lime scooters. And of course, I don't want my 10 year old out in the street. I'm going to let him ride the Lime scooter on the sidewalk as a safety yeah. uh, precaution. But some of those kids on those line scooters are really young uh, to be on a motorized well, piece of equipment. It's 18 and over. Yeah, you, you have to be so 18 and older. And you can't. Our, our they're data, not supposed to be riding on them anyway. Yeah. They're, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Our yeah. data shows that you know, we have a high percentage of people over 40 renting the scooters, mm -hmm. but it's, it's hard to know how many of those people are renting the scooters and then handing them off to someone yes. younger. Yeah. So, um, and, and to your point, um, you know, that's, I think that's really the underlying piece to all this is completing our planned downtown network of mm -hmm. all ages and abilities, bikeways. Um, we have about 50 miles planned. We have mm -hmm. our first one installed. So there's a lot of mileage left to build. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's all I have okay. as far as, you know, areas for improvement, but happy to discuss more. If someone should get fined, where does that money go? Um, so if, if we document a violation mm -hmm. and find Lyme, that money comes back into the program, which we use on, on things like the bike parking. We, we use it on the Centennial Trail detour around the Bosch lot. Okay. Um, we use it on you know, the ads and marketing and signage. So R Related, somewhat related expense. Yeah, okay. yeah, it has to be related to the program. Just a big thank you to Colin. Yes. <clears throat> he is always so receptive. Um, we had a quick meeting today to talk about just a couple items that came before, I think, your office and my office mm -hmm. as far as safety issues. And he got right on it, brought his team together, and we met. And um, just feel good that we're talking about it and that we can share with our constituents that we've got their safety in mm -hmm. our best interest and we're doing our best to keep things safe. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for meeting. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Thanks, Colin. Have a good afternoon. Uh, Inga? Good afternoon. I'm just here to brief the um, contract amendment. I don't have any slides for it. So this is amending our existing contract with Dowell to add on four items. 
One of them is to do a little bit of value engineering on some of the projects that came in with really high costs to get them down to those limits that, that council put into the resolution that was adopted, the 300 and 500,000. Um, the other are adding in those three studies that were approved in cycle 10 for Indian Trail, 18th Avenue, and then Altamont and 11th Avenue. Questions? Yeah, but I'm going to talk to you offline. Okay. Thanks again. No Thank problem. you. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Matt, Boston. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, just for the uh, resolution shaping out the 2024 uh, budget timing, um, just kind of when we're going to be passing, um, obviously with vacancies on the council, uh, new council members coming on in November, when November 28th is when the, um, the uh, vote is um, confirmed or certified. Um, we wanted to uh, we wanted to have that uh, vote of the budget happen prior to uh, new council members uh, trying to soak in everything within a week period and then voting on that. Um, so that's that's the plan there. And um, there, as you'll see, there are a couple blanks on the actual resolution itself. Um, I, I know that the uh, the administration is um, on board with the the resolution in its form, um, but the blanks were left blank for the purpose of the budget committee kind of talking about that. That we have a for everybody that knows and doesn't know, we have a. Um, Council and administration collective meeting. Generally, that happens every Friday. We were going to have one last Friday, but we had it with just the the number nerds, as some might call it. And we're going to be doing it uh, next ne or this Friday to uh, kind of hammer out those numbers for the budget hearings when the actual uh, the preliminary will be delivered to us, etc. So it, it's essentially just moving everything two weeks uh, ahead. Any questions? Thanks, Matt. Okay, uh, Sarah Thompson. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Thompson, Therapeutic Court Coordinator for Municipal Court. And a couple of months ago, I was here to present a briefing paper that said that the Administrative Office of the Courts announced $9.7 million statewide to allocate to courts of limited jurisdiction to support the therapeutic court programs, considered to be an ongoing funding stream, even though there's annual applications, but this is fortunate that we can support our ongoing efforts. So municipal court did submit for five grant applications to the administrative office of the courts. On June 30th, we received award notifications for four of those applications with notice to proceed effective July 1st of 23 that we can start spending the money for community court in the amount of $293,750, DUI court in the amount of $76,350, DVITC, which is our Domestic Violence Intervention Treatment Court, in the amount of $341,549.68, and for our Veterans Court in the amount of $26,400. So the purpose of this briefing paper is one to inform council that we did receive awards from the state, which is fantastic. It's the first time we've been funded. Um, and then also to come forward and ask um, for permission and request that we can start the positions that are associated with these funds. For our domestic violence intervention court, we have one community justice counselor and one community justice specialist. Those positions are already funded. They were funded by the AOC in our initial grant application from uh, 22. We now have the ongoing funds to continue to support those positions, so it's fantastic. For community court, though, we did request for two positions from the Administrative Office of the Courts, which they do support. That would be for two community justice specialists, and it would allow us to help with uh, community navigation, case management, um, specifically allocated to our community justice, I'm sorry, to our community court team. So I'm here to hopefully ask for that permission. <laughs> what about veterans court? So Veterans Court, the 26,400, we are really supported by the VA okay. and our mentors. So we don't have any positions that are needed. With the AOC funding, it couldn't be to supplant anything that we already had. So we already have positions allocated um, and we don't need any additional. And the, the, 
the positions that you mentioned just now, um, are those funded through the grants that are for these programs? Or is that a separate funding? They are going to be through the Administrative Office of the Courts. Okay. So when we did an initial application to the AOC for our DV court to get that started, that was not considered an ongoing. That was a one-time, let's get it going, we're going to support it. But the state came back and said, we need to support our lower jurisdictions. And so fortunately, there's almost $9.7 million every year for the state to share. And this should be the amounts that we receive on an ongoing basis. Um, the only thing it could go up if other courts aren't going to be using their funds, they will let us know every May. <laughs> and of course, we will kindly take additional funding. <laughs> and do, do the amounts, to a certain extent, reflect kind of the, the, the volume of, of individuals that would go through these programs? I mean, is that why 26,000 for veterans? Because there's just a lot fewer number who would use that program? Unfortunately, the amount that we did request from the AOC is not the funding that we received. Okay. Um, because there was only 9.7, the state had 48, I believe, applications uh, from 48 different jurisdictions. So that money had to be trickled down. Uh, to put it in relation, the community court program, what we submitted for, I believe, was 373000 and we received the two ninety three. So about $80,000 less than our request. Veterans Court, we did request, I believe it was in the 50,000 range. Again, the positions are the big bulk. So when you see the big numbers, that's when you know you have positions. But Veterans Court, that was mainly to support some treatment, some additional training, um, drug testing, things that we needed in that court program too. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and Appreciate do I need to be present tonight for this? Um, are we? Agenda yeah, are we voting on this tonight? Council President, is this on our agenda tonight? Or is it first reading? Yeah. Is it first reading? Uh, no. Administrative Office of the Courts. Um, is it first reading? I don't know. I'll check. Well, we'll, we'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We'll let you know soon. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But, but you, you really wouldn't have to come back for that. We, we've, no. we've heard the, the updates here, so you'd be just fine. You don't have to be oh, back I for that. I think it's meeting. under... Yes, uh, no. I think it's under contract. Under the consent? Yeah. consent. Well, we'll figure it out. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. No, we're not doing those tonight. Uh, okay, I think our last uh, item, unless I missed something, is the regional authority resolution. Uh, do we know who's briefing that? Uh, Council member, or Council President, can you hear? Council President? And so, Thank you. So we are going to, we have asked on, on your behalf, uh, Councilmember Cathcart, the mayor, to come at 3.30 to talk about the staffing for that. Oh, I'm okay. I think it was Councilmember Stratton that was Was it you that asked for that? For what? For um, the Regional Homeless, homeless have an update Authority Resolution for an update? Yeah, I would just like an update, and I'd like to know, um, yeah, I had a couple questions. So we'll do that at 3, we've asked her to come at 3.30 to do that. Okay her or her designee to do that at 3.30. Do you want to hold further discussion until 3.30? I think so. Right now, the way it stands, what I'm hearing from all of you is that we have a lot of unanswered questions still and that people are wanting to defer that until we get those questions answered. So That's, that's my inclination. Yeah, so I, I'm hearing from two of you that that is your preferred. And, and, and we're not going to put this forward if it's going to go down in flames. That right. would be it. And we'll have to decide how... Um, if it's two weeks or the end of August. Of Probably the 21st, that's when we're back. The 21st is the first that might be meeting the after our two week yeah. recess, so yeah. Okay, uh, anything else on this item or anything for the good of the order? All right, we are adjourned and we'll be back at 3.30. So what was it she was asking about? Ask yes. Yeah. Okay. Lori is over here just cracking up about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com. I missed it. And then yeah. when she said, did he say, I was like, wait, that is yeah, what he yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>